Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third in our online training sessions. Uh, this one is not how to webinar. I'm going to uh, quickly change my presentation. I do apologize. I've been playing around with presentations this morning and jumped to the wrong one. Proves that it's live. There we go. Uh, so this is actually week three in the well-being workshops, and this is nutrition. Uh, so uh, I hope you've grabbed yourself a coffee. Um, this is kindly being hosted by our colleagues at uh, POD, which is now part of RED. So welcome to today's session. We're going to just take you through how to take part. Uh, this will give time for everybody to come through the waiting room. We've got about 135 people registered for today. Uh, so we're just going to give them a little bit of time to all join us. Um, in the meantime, anybody who's new, I'll talk you through how to get involved. So if you are joining on a laptop or a PC view, you will have this kind of format whereby you will have a small menu to the right hand side of your screen. You can open and close the control panel menu by clicking on the red arrow at the top. Um, and when you click, it will expand or it will close it down to allow you to see uh, more of the actual main presentation. Uh, when you're doing that, uh, go through to if you need to ask an actual uh, question, if you want to send a question in to us, you can do this. Uh, have your control panel open. You may first need to click on the small white triangle next to the word questions in order to expand the question box. Uh, then into the question box, type in the question you want to send to us and don't forget to press the send button though. Please note all the questions that come in show to myself as administrator only and then I'll try and feed those into the guys as and when is appropriate throughout the presentation or towards the end where we have a section especially dedicated for any further questions that you have. So you can send those in at any time. Um, if you're using a mobile device, uh, such as a mobile phone or a tablet, your view will be slightly different. Your menu will appear slightly differently. So the, look out for the big question mark at the top. Uh, once you click on that, it will open a question panel. You can enter your question and don't forget, of course, to press send to send it through. Uh, please bear in mind, if you can't see uh, your options, all you need to do is to run your finger over the screen again, just to bring your menu options back into view. Now, uh, there is a video in today's presentation. It's only a short video at one point. The presenter will launch the video, but when they do, please bear in mind two things. Don't change the uh, layout. If you're viewing on a mobile device, it's important you don't change orientation at that time, because if you do, it will go back to the beginning of the video and you'll be out of sync with the rest of the presentation. So try and keep your mobile device in the same orientation for when the video plays. Uh, the videos do take a moment or two to play, so just bear with the presenter and then they'll launch those and you will see them. Uh, if there's any sound issues, please note the sound is fixed and has been tested from this side, so it's all okay. If you are uh, struggling to hear or it's too loud, you'll need to change your local sound settings on your own device. Uh, there are a couple of polls in today's session. So when the poll launches, it will appear across the screen a bit like the one on the test panel now. Uh, choose your answer and then all you have to do is press submit. And if you try and do that as soon as you possibly can. And as well as that, we also sometimes have handouts. There is a handout available for today. At the end of the session, I'm sure uh, John, the, the main presenter today, will remind you about this handout, which is available. Uh, you go to the handout tab on your panel, uh, click the white triangle again, and if on a mobile device, look for the document tab, and then click on the individual document and follow your own local device's instructions for download. Please bear in mind, uh, you will need to download the document before the end of the webinar uh, to get the handout. And then there is a short survey right at the end. As soon as the uh, webinar closes, there is a short short survey. If you can stay on the line, please do so. Take part in today's survey. It should only take you about five to ten minutes to complete. We do read all of the answers that come back in, um, and we feed those back to our colleagues over at uh, NFE Group as well. Uh, so please uh, take your time to fill in that survey, and remember uh, just to press send at the end of the survey to make sure that the completed one goes through. If you miss it on today, there is another opportunity to take the same survey in the follow-up email that will come out tomorrow. 
Uh, so now I'm going to hand over to our speakers. As usual, joining me today from the NFE group is Andy Neal and Ian Westmore, who's in the background. Uh, and then we've also got a special guest presenter today, John Sunderland Wright, who I'm going to hand over the screen presenting rights to. Uh, so if everybody could just bear with me, I'm going to pass those over to John now. And then I'm sure uh, Andy is going to introduce him and talk about today's topic. And I'm going to move on into the background. So over to you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, good morning, everybody. Hope you're well, and thank you for joining us again. And uh, thank you for all of your feedback from last week, uh, which was very good and uh, very pleasing for us because we put quite a lot of effort into these things. So it's nice when we get some good feedback. Um, so yeah, we're very pleased with that. And uh, in fact, uh, the suggestions we take on board and it allows us to improve and uh, roll it out to other clients as well. So thanks for that. Um, so, as I introduced last week, the Mavs Gauser, John Sunderland Wright, is joining us today. Um, I've known John 15 years now, um, and we set up Performance on Demand uh, at that time because um, we're both passionate about um, helping people to live better lives, um, improve their resiliency and their well being. So, John specializes in this particular area, so I thought I'd get him back in today um, and, uh, and uh, let him deliver this one. But I'll be back in for the questions at the end, so uh, no further ado, I'll hand over to John. Brilliant. Thanks, Andy. Um, happy Friday, everyone. Uh, if it's a special day for you, happy birthday, happy anniversary and happy midsummer. Um, here we are, can't believe we're in the middle of um, June. Anyway, um, I'm looking forward to spending um, this session with you. And um, I am the Mad Scout, so I'm going to get you doing a few mad things today um, around this subject. And as Andy said at the end, if you've got any questions, because it is one of those areas where um, there's tons and tons of stuff we could talk about. So I was racking my brain thinking, what can I give you that's going to give you some useful, simple tips to help you both with uh, nutrition and exercise and just look at these sorts of things in the mind field there is so i'm going to all the stuff i'm going to talk to you about today is scientifically proven medically proven and hopefully you'll find it useful so really i know you've had two sessions already with andy and you've looked at some uh, thing around the heart and last week you spent a fair bit of time looking at fatigue and sleep and the effects on the brain and i just want to put this sort of thing into some context so just hopefully this will go. So what are the origins of health? Um, as you can see in front of you, this is called the illness wellness continuum. And the NHS use this to just sort of measure where we are as an individual in relation to our total wellness. Um, and really the origins of health are all about medical factors that support human health and well-being. And um, just looking obviously on a scale here, if we're down here, if we get ourselves ill, we're going to plonk down to this area here and then we'll go and seek some sort of help and support through the NHS and they'll give us some therapy, some drugs or treatments and hopefully push us into the middle part here, the fives and sixes. And this is an interesting, because a lot of us fall into this area if we're not well. And this is called false wellness. You're not sick but not really healthy either. And you'll see here the higher levels of wellness, and so good health, seven, eight, nine, you'll see this very simple factors that promote that. I'm, I know you, you know all of this, it's not rocket science. So regular exercise, good nutrition, being educated in understanding what's good for us, and what isn't, uh, and minimal nerve interference. And obviously that's not about talking about people who do your head in, who, who annoy you. Uh, or there it can be, but it is about dealing with stress and the, and the, the factors that cause us to get a bit annoyed. Um, so obviously if we're ill, we're gonna get ourselves down this end and then we're gonna seek some treatment. Obviously we'll go to the NHS and it's interesting here, we call about the National Health Service. Actually, we don't have a National Health Service. What we do have is a National Illness Service because actually their main job is to help us when we're ill to bring us fat. And they're actually about 99% of the entire budget of the NHS is spent on helping people who are already ill. And therefore it's less than 1% is spent on the education of helping people to improve wellness. So what I'd like you to do right now, and obviously we can't hear you um, at all, but I want you to look across that continuum 
And where would you score yourself right now on that scale? Where would you be? I just want you to reflect on that. Now, brilliant if you're up here at 10. I'd love you to be 10. And obviously, you're doing things. You've got that wellness lifestyle. Obviously, if you're ill, you're going to be down here and you're seeking treatment. But I'd say a good majority of people are here. And really what we're gonna to do today is I'm gonna give you a few things that to hopefully try to inspire you to start maybe going to, if you're a six, what would it take for you to be a seven? What little steps can you take to help improve your, your wellness? Because the, the, the benefits are huge for you and all of us. And you'll see that I've, I've, I've put the little thing, current account. And I often talk about wellness as having a current account and opening a current account that's called my own health and well-being. And actually with a current account, um, one of the key things to keep it healthy is to make deposits. And really what we're going to talk about today is simple little things you can do that don't take that much time that you're going to put healthy deposits into that, that account. Because actually there are already things that are coming out of that account and we don't want to get it into uh, a withdrawal so, uh, so that you're withdrawn in that account. So anything that we can do to help that will really be move you towards the right hand side. So we're going to look at a couple of areas today to help you with that and hopefully you'll find that useful. So um, Andy, you remember talked in the first session about your heart and showed you the breathing in for five and out for five and showed you on the um, heart software the positive effect that had on heart rhythms. Um, the health of your heart and of your brain go hand in hand. They are massively linked and then what I'm going to do today and I thought about this a lot and I thought why don't I just spend a little bit of time looking at both the health of your heart and some things that you can do to really improve cardiovascular health and circulation and also I'm going to give you some great tips to help the uh, health of your brain and actually I'm going to share with you some of the latest research in neuroscience around how we can massively improve the performance of our brain and the upshot of that is as we age, we can make significant improvements to its performance. And the research shows that it does help stave off dementia. Um, so they're the two areas I'm gonna talk about today in this little session. And don't forget at the end, any questions around this, please do send them through to Ian, the administration, and we'll try our best to give you some great answers uh, around that. So what I thought I'd do, first of all, is just start and look at the human heart the ticking time bomb. Um, so the big issue for um, cardiovascular health are the risk factors that cause us all maybe to have uh, some heart issues. Um, it's still one of the largest killers in this country, although over the last 30 years, we've got better and better at treating it. The, you'll see here, these are the big risk factors um, and you'll know about cholesterol. I'm actually gonna focus a tiny little bit uh, a bit later on, on improving the good cholesterol, uh, HDL. Um, but what I'm going to um, talk about today, I'm going to look at a slight bit of stuff on diet and how to help that. We're going to look at the sort of uh, risk factor from uh, abdominal obesity. I'm going to look at, obviously, you can see the exercise, the, um, the lack of exercise increases risk. So obviously, we exercise. And I'm going to show you some key little things that you can do uh, to help you. So that's what we're going to focus on today. I'll just both down. So first of all, though, let's talk about this whole thing about uh, our metabolic rate and basal metabolic rate. Um, you see there the sicko, the sicko effect, and all that stands for is calories in and calories out. And we all know this. It's not rocket science that actually. The amount of calories we take in and the amount of calories we expend, if they balance, we stay the same weight. If we want to increase our weight, we take in more calories. If we want to lose in weight, we, we either take in less or burn more. It, it, it's very simple. So but what's basal metabolic rate? Now, this is the amount of calories that each and every single one of us need every day 
just to exist. Now, if you just lay down on the couch and did nothing all day, your body still needs calories to burn to enable the key organs in your body to be able to function. So there is a set amount of calories that each of us need to take in every single day, and that's called our basal metabolic rate. And I'm gonna show you how to calculate, calculate this now and give an example of, of, uh, of my own basal metabolic rate and show you then how, uh, if I need to lose weight, how many calories do I need to drop to or if I need to gain weight? Now, this, this calculator we've got for you, you can download it so you can work out because each and every single one of us is an individual. But um, I, I often get people talking about uh, saying, well, you know, uh, I've got a high metabolism, you know, and I can eat loads and loads and loads and I never put on weight. And then you see someone else goes, you know, I, I only have to look at food and I put weight on. Um, and is that true? Is, is so, so does our metabolism affect uh, our weight? Actually, there's little evidence for that. Um, there are Actually, the bigger you are, the higher your metabolism because your organs are bigger and actually they will use more energy to keep them going. But I, I would say that each and every single one of us as an individual, um, that we have a, a, a sort of different propensity. There are factors to do with our muscle mass, how you burn uh, calories, whether your body burns more fat or more sugars. Um, there's something around something called leptin, which is a hormone that we produce to make us feel hungry. Some people produce more than others. Um, there's all the, your overall fitness. All of these take come into account. So really, there's just two types of people: people who are uh, have a prone to be obese, and those who aren't, based on the the way your body works. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to calculate this now. Uh, now hopefully we'll go straight to this. I'm just going to get rid of you guys. Just bear with escape that. Okay, so um, basal metabolic rate. It's a quite a bit of a calculation. Uh, male, female here. Um, you can do it in uh, metric or imperial measures. So I'm a male, last time I looked. So I know, as I weighed myself this morning, I weigh 70 kilograms, that's exactly 11 stone. Now, I'm not the tallest of guys. I'm five foot six, so it's 168 centimeters. And I am 57 years old. And I know you look at me going, no way, John, are you 57? Now I'm 180. Um, so um, there I go. It works it out also in 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 Imperial for you. So it very quickly measures my body max, mass index BMI. Um, BMI is an okay measure um, in terms of quite old, actually. It's about, it was done in the 19th century. And it makes a few assumptions and actually doesn't really take into account muscle mass. So I think one of the famous guys was Daley Thompson, who was actually had, uh, I think, 1% fat in his body was pure muscle. But actually using the BMI scale, he was obese. So it's not a true measure. So there's better measures to look at that. But it says I'm 24.8, a 5.6. Technically, OK, I'm right on the edge. And I know myself really um, at 11 stone at my thing. I could do with probably losing about, I don't know, three kilograms, which is half a stone. And make me that will push me back into that gray area, which is fine. So anyway, what does it mean? If we move across here, it says that if I just sat lying down all day and did nothing, I still need to take in 1,262 calories per day just so I stay exactly the same as I am. But none of us lie down and do nothing all day. We're busy doing stuff. So we need to add in a factor of how much exertion we display during the day. And that's called the Harris-Benedict factor form, uh, or formula. Um, so here it is. And um, you'll see here, you times that by however busy we are doing stuff. It's all about how much we exercise. So if we don't exercise much, uh, you're just adding 1.2, 1.375, a bit more. Now I, I do sort of, I do a lot of walking every day, 
about four miles a day. It's certainly in lockdown. I cycle a good few times a week. Um, so I'm quite moderate. Um, so if I type in 1.55, there you go. So here we go. I now, my true basal metabolic rate is 1,956 calories. So if I can take in 1,956 calories a day, I will stay exactly the same. I'll, I'll remain 70 kilos as long as I can carry on at the level of exercise that I'm doing. Of course, if I drop off on that, um, uh, my calories can go down. Now, if I want to lose weight, the interesting thing about weight loss, and there's a lot of stuff around it, diets, really it's not about diet, it's about just changing habits. And really, if I want to lose weight, gently, with that would be around about two pounds per week which i would lose which is a great gentle way to keep losing weight and now i won't notice it and i'm highly unlikely then to put it back on so i can go down to i need to go down to 1565 now it is a caveat here with that 1565 calories in a balanced diet if i ate 1565 calories of cake i'd be in trouble um, so it's about the balance between the two. Obviously, if I'm underweight, I can go up more. So if I want to put a bit of weight on, I can up the calories. Basically, what we say here is basal metabolic rate is um, if we need to lose weight, you take 20% off your true BMR. Now, the interesting thing here is this. If I up my exercise, so uh, let's go. I'm going to go more. Obviously. I can eat more and it's basically that the more we can exert calories the more that we can take in particularly if it's a balanced diet this is a great measure for you just to get because it, it's basically individual to you your height your weight your 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 uh, gender and it will give you a true uh, look at so then if we're trying to lose weight is starting to look at labels on maybe foods that we're buying or there's some great apps the fitbit apps that can just point at any food and it'll tell you how many calories are in that whether it's raw or cooked and you can just start to manage that more and you'll gently gently uh, lose weight in in that way so as i say we've got that for you uh, there we go okay so that's a little bit on basal metabolic rate so it appears oh, that's better sorry about that just locked up so there are two tests for us two tests to help us and thinking am i overweight and what's john, the risk john, yeah john just needs to go to present a view mate oh thank you very much is that you got that now is that okay yep. That's it. How thank big is your waistline? Yeah, brilliant. So thank you very much. Thanks for that, Andy. Um, so two tests, two tests in terms of uh, cardiovascular risk. Um, this one, I'm not going to get you to do the second one we are, but it's measuring our waistline. And there's a specific area where we, we measure. I'm not going to take the clothes off or anything like that. <laughs> um, so bottom rib. In between the bottom rib and the top of your hip, which is your waistline. So essentially, we measure around there, which will go across your belly button. And as you take, put the measure around and just slightly breathe out, um, you'll get your waistline. So for men, irrespective of age, it needs to be low 37 inches. If it's above 40, it increases the risk significantly uh, cardiovascularly. And you can see there for women, uh, if it's uh, less below 31 and a half, brilliant. And if it's above 34, massively in it increases the risk significantly. Obviously, if you're between 37 and 40, you're sort of leaning. So it's just an indication that if it's like that, don't, I don't want to worry about it. But then thinking maybe, maybe you can start trying to start looking at dropping those through uh, either calorie control uh, and I'd say that as well as a bit of exercise. The second measure I'm going to get you to do now, and it's going to be a bit tricky for us. Right. Can you feel a pulse in your foot? Right. Um, I'm, I need your help here, Andy. So, um, yeah, or Ian, I'm going to bend that down and just get on the table. Uh, can you see my foot? Yep, spot on. 
spot on. Right. Yep. So I'd like you to put your finger so everyone here don't cross your legs as you're doing it. But as I want you to plunk. Now I plunk my finger there. Gently press. I can feel a little pulse. You can do it on the other side as well. Um, in that, don't worry if you don't want to do it now. You can do it this evening with a uh, with with a fret with a friend, a little bit for fun. Right, why is that important? Um, your foot is the furthest point away from your heart and it's a measure of your circulation and how good your circulation is. Look, it's never going to be as power and strong as up here because I'm right close to my heart here, but down there and it shows that I've got better circulation. Now, please do not worry if you think, I can't feel anything, I can't feel anything. You're not dead. And uh, and blood is flowing around there because if you still got your foot and it hasn't turned black, then you're you're okay. Um, circulation. How do you improve circulation? It's quite simple actually. And I, I thought I'd put this in for you guys. And maybe I know you're in lockdown at the moment, but your job is all about sitting down all day in a car and a vehicle and and watching people. And, and it's great you do that, but it's obviously putting issues on. So circulation is affected by sitting down. So one of the things is to try and stand up, because just literally standing up and walking around helps the circulatory system. And literally, if we can stand up for an hour to an hour and a half a day, um, it really will help boost that. Um, so I know it may be difficult to, to put literally maybe if, in between lessons to stop and go for a little walk and at the end of a lesson when you're having a gap is maybe get out the car and do a stand up. It depends on the weather. I know certainly you wouldn't want to been doing that in the last 24 hours with the rain as it has been down south. But really is a great little indication and slowly but surely you'll start to notice that um, you'll get a stronger and stronger pulse in your foot through improving circulation. And again, during lockdown now, it's a great time to maybe start to get yourself walking about, moving about more, um, and that will really help you. So they're the two key tests that we do. They're very simple, but then just give you an indication of where you are and maybe something that you might like to do about it. But we all have choices. Of course we have choices. And um, it must be difficult for you guys when you're when you're working is uh, nutrition and food and picking things up because obviously you're, you're probably doing lessons in the morning and lunchtime and then definitely in the evening when people are available so how fitting in decent bits of food for you but the thing is one of the big rules in nutrition and by the way we, we we talk we use the word nutrition and not eating because not everything you eat is nutritious as you guess. Now look, some of those things you think yummy. They, by the way, they taste lovely, and and the the quick and easy and available. But one of the big rules of thumb is food uh, that looks beige. Um, now I'm getting to that age. I'm 57. I'm walking. I, we're walking around the um, Sainsbury today. I need new trousers, and I suddenly went to put a pair of beige trousers. And I don't know. That's just getting old. That I think beige. Uh, and my wife just said, "Step away from the beige." She said, "You do it with food. Don't go there with with trousers." Anyway, so I haven't. Um, so we know about this stuff. So really, it's about colour. And it's called the Mediterranean diet. You know, and you know, I know you know this sort of stuff, but all of these food stuff, the more colours that we can have on our plates, the more nutritious, the better they are for you. And I, I could go on for uh, ages around the, this sort of stuff. But you know, the likes of using olive oil against any other oils, um, obviously oily fish, seeds and nuts, all of these sorts of foods are better for you. And actually, the, a, a lot of them you can eat raw, which is actually quite good for you and on on the go and um i'm going to talk more about this a bit later on but uh, you know, i know you may be just a bit, a bit of planning before you go out is making little graze packs but i know you can buy the little graze packs i know andy buys a load of them and just snacks on these little things these are seeds and nuts but they're really good for lowering um um blood pressure really full of full of the vitamins i'm going to talk more about vitamins a bit later on as well but just to be able to snack on Joe, these things, yeah. I'm very sorry to interrupt you. We're, we're uh, having problems with those watching on a mobile device. 
Uh, I've tried to fix it in the background, but I don't think I'm going to be able to fix it. So I just okay. wanted to alert you to the fact that they can't see you. They can only see the present presentation at the moment. So Thank anybody you. watching on a mobile, if you can try and um, give them some visual description uh, it, through audio so that they can understand what you're doing. Um, I am aware of the problem, everybody. I am trying to fix it in the background. I'm going to disappear again and try and work on that. Okay. Oh, thanks for that, Ian. So for those who can't see, I'm holding up a little plastic, um, little round um, and Tupperware thing, actually got quite cheaply. Uh, and in here, I've just put some sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, uh, uh, walnuts and almonds. Um, and just I just make these little things up and I just have them just to snack on, to graze on. The, it just stops me eating chocolates and stuff like that but I don't, I don't which i don't really eat so um but these sorts of things can really just help and maybe easy for you portable when you're working in in, in vehicle what I've, I've i've shown here is the key foods to raise hdl cholesterol hdl cholesterol is the good cholesterol and if anyone's got any questions around that a bit later on more than happy to talk about it Look, the more HDL cholesterol you get, the better it is because basically it absorbs the bad cholesterol and gets rid of it in your body. These foods are very, very good for improving high levels of, of the really good cholesterol. In fact, any beans that you can eat, obviously baked beans, but they're okay as long as there's not too much sugar in the, in the can. Uh, um, I don't know, Bellotti, cannellini beans, uh, kidney beans, any of them, they've got very high levels of soluble fiber. Now, soluble fiber is um, is a, uh, basically grabs hold of bad cholesterol and takes it out of your body. So any of these sorts of things that you can get in your diet really do you some good. So that's that one. Uh, and again, any more information, we can I can send you loads of information on some really good foods to get you. And I know Andy's going to talk about that and other resources available for, for you in next week's session. So please come along to that. It'd be great. So um, I'm going to do a little bit just around exercise now. And um, just so we know exercise is good for us. And I'm going to show you in a minute a little, a little bit how good it is for the brain as well. So how much is enough? And you'll see there just anywhere between 75 minutes, to, you know, two and a half hours a week of aerobic. And aerobic is just getting the heart rate going, just getting your heart rate going to us, you know, sort of a, so you can feel it beating. Now, some of us don't mind running. Some of us hate it. And what I thought is it just shows you you don't have to be running Ironman triathlons to get decent, useful exercise. Just going for a brisk walk. If you've got a dog, take the dog for a longer walk and just walk a little bit quicker. Obviously, when we get swimming baths open again, it'll be great because that's a really good way of exercising for the heart and the muscles. But just even working in the garden, working in the garden for a couple of hours burns off a lot of calories and is actually good cardiovascularly. But I, I, I've got a little issue about exercise and then if you've never done exercise for a while is like how how much should we raise our heart rate up? So what's good for a heart? Maybe what isn't? So we're going to get to our first poll now and hopefully I'll be able to do that. Um, da, da, da. Select a poll. OK. And I'm going to launch a little poll. So uh, when exercising, when exercising, is it okay for your heart to rise to what? Go on, what do you think? What's it safe to do? Oh, I've got loads of answers here. Oh, we got a good 60% of your vote, 63. I'll give you a few more seconds to vote. Very good. This is some cracking answers. Uh, okay. Oh, we've got 75% vote at 24. So I'm going to close the vote. Okay. Thank you for everyone who took part of that. And I'm going to share it now with you. So can you all see that? Yeah. So we see... Uh, Brilliant. Uh, every, uh, quite a lot of people have gone in for that mid-131 thingy, but we've got a, a good mix across all. It doesn't matter that I, as long as you're fit. That's a, it's an interesting answer, actually. Right. You are all right. 
and you're all wrong. <laughs> so I'll stop that now, I'll unshare it. <laughs> so why is that? The interesting thing about heart rate and exercise is, and this is why we worry a little bit, is it's to do with our age. Just bear with me, just need to, um, I got one of those nuts stuck in my throat. <laughs> right, so safe exercise heart rate range. So what we do is you take 220 beats a minute. That's absolute maximum the human heart can go to. And obviously, hopefully not many of us can get there. What we do straight away is you take off your age. So uh, let's do me again. I'm 57. So my maximum heart rate should be 163 beats a minute. However, that's my heart working at 100% of its capacity. Now, I'm nowhere near fit enough. That's, you, I don't go there. There's actually a safe range for us to work in. And that is, excuse me. Excuse, sorry about that. It's between 60 and 80% is a safe range. So if you look at me, my safe range is 100 to 130 beats a minute. Now, the fitter I get, I can go beyond 130, but I never go to 163. But I only do that in short periods. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, what we do is anyone who starts exercising, we get them to go on the lower end first. Excuse me. Well, um, while, while John tries to uh, cure his cough there, we're getting loads of water down him. Um, I'll just come in here. Take your time, mate. It's uh, got plenty of time. <laughs> like a BBC news reader. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry about this, guys. It's really got me. Hiya. <coughs> oh, yeah. Uh, just te temporarily, I'll just let you know, we've identified that the problem seems to be with Android devices today. So um, I'm fully aware of everybody who's got the issue with the Android devices. I'll need to research that with GoToWebinar following. So I can't get the uh, cameras back on for anybody watching on an Android device, I'm afraid, just to keep you guys up to date. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks for that. And whilst I've recovered from um, <clears throat> having a mild little session here, sorry about that, guys. So, um, yeah, um, 130, 100 beats to 130 for me. Again, so work that out for yourself. No, I'm struggling here. Sorry about this. <clears throat> oh, there you go. <laughs> Would you believe it? I've done about 30 of these. I've never had that happen to me. So there you go. Sorry about that. First time so when you this first time for anything, mate, and it makes it funny. You can all have a good laugh at me, so that's okay. So please do be careful when you exercise. Um, just take it gently. You haven't done it for a while. Work out what your lowest rate. So what I would do, work out what the 60% rate is. Stay around that. Do whatever exercise that helps you do that. And then slowly build up to increase your heart rate. <clears throat> that's 60 to 80% is a safe range you're still is good cardiovascular exercise and it will help you lose weight so just be kind uh, be mindful of that and don't go crazy is my thing but the reason being is when you push your heart beyond 80 percent of its capacity that's when problems can arise so just be careful um so that safe range is, is really key so let's do something now about helping you in terms of uh, re exercises to relax you now the interesting thing is i know you you know that you're doing some sort of cardiovascular exercise the problem for you guys is sitting in the car well probably like that and obviously it's your posture so what i thought i'd do is i've got a video in a minute but i'm going to take you through something called progressive muscle relaxation which is very very simple uh easy exercise to do that you can do in vehicle but also it's these exercises are very good to help us go to sleep and um, so um, uh, if you know the guy, uh, Dr. Michael Mosley is often on BBC 
he swears by this as lying in bed, helping you relax the muscles that helps you sleep. So linking to what Andy was talking about last week, but actually it's just good to get rid of the stress of your muscles. And again, you can do it in your car. So um, I'm gonna show you two or three, well, just two little exercises that you can do right now. So if you join me and <coughs> I can get my voice going again. So if you put your arms out like that for us, can you see me? And if you can't, for those who can't see, is put up your forearms, stretch them out in front of you uh, at sort of shoulder height. Open your palms up. Now what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to squeeze your, your hands in as if you're squeezing a lemon, like that, and tighten up your forearms, okay? Now what you're gonna do is I want you to pull your arms towards your chest with them tight. And as you do that, I would like you to take a deep breath in for five seconds. Remember, Andy talking about breathing in for five and you breathe in all the way. So here we go. Okay, and then breathe, relax your arms, go and take them back and relax and open out and breathe out for five. So let's do that again. In, breathe in. breathe out okay so we just do that a couple of times the next one to help your neck and shoulders what we're going to do you've got your shoulders here we're going to lift up your shoulders as high as you can towards the bottom of your ear and then so we're going to do the breathing in for five as we lift our shoulders up and then relax your shoulders back down again breathing out for five so here we go And again, just do that a couple of times. What we then do is progressive muscle relaxation. We go to your abdomen, and I'm not gonna make you do this now, but basically you would just pull your abdomen in, keep on pulling it in, um, hold that, and then breathe out, let it go out again for that. And then go down to your legs and it's your, it's your feet, basically. What you do is you tighten your calves and, uh, and then you pull your feet towards your shins, breathe in and then relax them. Just two times around those four things will help you um, be able just to relax the muscles, strengthen them a little bit. And it's a good little thing just to relax your in, in, in vehicle and just help your posture a little bit. Now, another one I thought we'd do is um, just give you this video now. And if I can remember, where do you go for the video? bear with I've got it here's this little exercise video can you see yeah it is opening John just you might need to press the play button down on the bottom left hand side got you thank you Hi, I'm Christine Ely, Employee Health Promotion Coordinator at Mayo Clinic Arizona. Today we're going to demonstrate some stretches that are going to help reduce stress and tension in your lower back and your torso. To stretch your upper back and side, interlace your fingers, lift your arms straight up over your head, and slowly bend to the side, feeling the stretch. Come back up to center and stretch to the other side. To stretch your torso, you can do a seated twist. First, sit up straight, keeping your hips stationary. Twist all the way from your lower back all the way up to your head by looking over your shoulder. You can grab onto the armrest or the back of the chair while stretching. Relax, slowly return to the starting position, and repeat on the other side. To stretch your lower back, sit upright in your chair, bring one of your knees towards your chest, use your hands to grab the back of your thigh and gently pull it toward you. Keep your back straight, being careful not to lean forward. Hold the stretch for 30 seconds. You should feel tension in your lower back and the upper part of your buttock. Relax and slowly return to the starting position. 
Repeat the stretch with the other leg. To stretch out your hips, while sitting, cross one ankle over the knee on the other leg. Sit up tall and gently lean forward. Relax and slowly return to the starting position. Repeat the stretch with the other hip. Okay, so um, some simple little tools. It seems to uh, bear with. La, 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 la. All right, can we see that now? There you go. Brilliant. Just thought we'd give you some little things to help you just to maybe in the vehicle or just any time, just sit and gently couple of minutes just to get those stretches to get your posture going um and try them and we'll give you some more links to other things uh in some materials that andy's gonna uh, talk to you about a little bit next week so brilliant so um we're on the little last bit now and i want to spend just a little bit of time on uh your brain and fueling your brain and some things that you might find uh that useful for uh, brain health um, we don't often talk about thinking that we need to do anything for our brain. Um, however, um, in the... Can you see that? Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, in the last 20 years, uh, neuroscience, looking at what's going on in the human brain, has, has developed and developed and developed. And our understanding of how the brain works is significantly uh, improved um, due to MRI, CT scans and stuff like that. And um, this whole thing about um, brain performance as we age. Now, you'll see here what I mean by brain performance is all the cognitive functions, uh, concentration, focus, memory, uh, reaction speed, uh, spatial learning ability, all the good stuff that we do. Generally, as we age, you'll see the bottom uh, line, the black line there. As we age, well, as you see, when we're younger, we reach a peak around about 30 to 35, and then you'll see we're on the slippery slope and off it goes. However, that doesn't necessarily have to happen to us. Um, there's a wonderful piece of research done about five years ago in the United States, and it was looking at improving cognitive function in people between the ages of 68 and 85 years old. Um, something called neuroplasticity, the ability of your neurons or the, your brain nerve cells to be able to keep on connecting, uh, no matter how old you are. Um, and what they did, they gave them seven or eight key things to do every day that are known to bring out a very specific hormone called brain-derived neurotropic factor, which is called BDNF. You'll see that it's an absolute critical thing. Now, we all produce BDNF in our brain. But the more that we get it, the higher levels of performance we'll get. Now, what they noticed is in after six months of these people, and they were testing them every single month, they noticed after month six, 80% of all of them showed significant improvements in every single cognitive function and their brain had started to grow. And this is in an 85-year-old. It was actually an 85-year-old male who had the same cognitive function as a 22-year-old by the time it had finished. Now, he was quite good to start off with, but that was a big ramp up. There were a number of people who were uh, showing uh, the signs of onset dementia, okay, on the slippery slope all of them went into remission and got better. So there's more work around this that needs to be done, but what they may do is basically um, redraw this graph. If we can get more BDNF out, we get the higher level here. So what it does, you'll see, is it significantly increases performance. It gives us higher levels of resilience, 
and it delays disease and that's the big one so what i'm going to do is i'm going to show you what the blum and did they do to enable that to happen and it's really really easy and it links to cardiovascular health as well this so you, you heard andy talk about water last week and a little bit of hydration uh, your brain is 73 percent water water actually is a critical thing critical thing and it's simply just between a liter and a half and two liters a day uh, can help you help your brain in fact if you're only two percent dehydrated just two it has a 20 percent impact on every single cognitive function in you so you lose one fifth of the entire performance of your brain if you're just two percent dehydrated and quite a lot of people are around about the the acid test is have a look uh, at the color of your urine and um if it is a uh, darko than Pinot Grigio wine, I'm sorry if that's your tipple, you're dehydrated. So just get some water in you. Now we've talked a little bit about exercise and its importance for cardiovascular health. I cannot tell you how good exercise is for the brain. Um, as soon as you exercise, your heart releases a hormone called atrial nutritive peptide, peptide, AMP. That goes from your heart straight into your brain and it releases tons of BDNF. And a mate of mine who's probably one of the leading neuroscience researchers in the world, Dr. Michael Gray, did a load of work around this. And he showed that with just 10 minutes of exercise a day, you will double the amount of BDNF produced in the brain, synaptic plasticity in the brain. And it improves uh, performance at double to treble in, in humans. So that's how important, not only for cardiovascular health, but a little bit of exercise. Your brain will absolutely love you. Sleep, I know we talked about 79 hours. Please try and get as much as you can. Now, parents' essential oils, uh, you might not know them as that. Um, omega-3, omega-6, omega-9, omega-12, uh, they're critical for brain functionality. Um, I'm not a fan about supplements, and I'll talk about that in, in a few secs, but um, the, the mix that I talk about, that I, 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 unfortunately you've got to be careful when you read them because a, a tiny little sunflower seed got stuck in my throat and that's what happened, um, is that mix, that mix that I eat, which is two walnuts, two almonds, and a teaspoon each of sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, and linseeds or flax, that's every single parent essential oil you'll need for the entire day at the right level plus a whole load of other great minerals and basically honestly i have that every day usually just put it in a yogurt um and it really does help the other thing is about uh, probiotic bacteria extremely good for the for the brain and um so um some probiotics they're really anything you said probiotic yogurts or kimchi um uh, kombucha um kefir any of those sort or kefir it's called any of them really help brain um and it actually improves your guts as well sugar's a big one is reducing sugar intake um and we know it's sugar's not good in relation to diabetes type 2 and also uh, obesity so what i want to do is just basically run a, another quick poll uh where where how much is the right amount of sugar that we need today? So it's what was called the recommended daily allowance of sugar. What are we allowed? What do you think is the advice from the NHS? Mm. That's good, some good voting going on here. No, there's not time for anything. Oh, that's a big vote. We've got a big vote here. The 80% of you here. Right, let's have a close. I'm going to close the vote now. Thanks for 81% of you. That's really high. Uh, and I'm going to share the results. Here you go. So uh, the majority, 44%, you've gone for 24 grams, which is golly. Anyway, all the 20%, 10 points for Gryffindor, uh, it is 30 grams. Um, you can see there, uh, this is, that's what 30 grams looks like. Um, 24 grams is for children between seven and 10, um, and uh, 19 grams. Uh, Ian, sorry, uh, John, you've still got the um, poll showing, so they Thank can't you. see. 
Thank you very much. Good guy, yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, so the 19 grams for kids less than seven. And the interesting thing here is sugar. It absolutely messes up your brain and clogs it up and it, it breaks neural connections and it actually stops key amino acids entering your brain that are critical for brain health. So just want you to start noticing um, labels and sugars. I mean, I, I worked 16 years in the food industry and, and, and actually saw uh, how much sugar people put into processed foods. It's become really conscious of looking at sugars. Look, you need sugar, but literally be careful with it because A, it's obviously Lowering it is very good for brain health, but obviously therefore for diabetes type 2 and actually in terms of keeping weight off as well. So just be mindful of sugar. Uh, I know Andy's talked to you about cortisol and how to get rid of it. Uh, so the last thing I'm going to talk to you today about is uh, vitamins and the key vitamins for, for us. And vitamin D is probably the biggest thing enabling uh, for brain health. So obviously, uh, it's, it's, uh, a vitamin D, the main source is getting yourself outside, spending about 30 minutes a day, uh, getting some ultraviolet light. And luckily for us, ultraviolet light still comes through clouds and rain. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't need to be sunny. That's the key source of uh, our vitamin D. And what it'll do is it, it massively boosts the immune system. There's actually been some work done last month and showed that um, uh, in countries where the vitamin D uh, levels in adults was high, um, the effects of COVID-19 were reduced. So there were less serious uh, implications from COVID-19 because of that. Where countries in countries where generally in the population vitamin D levels are low, the implications went higher. And funny enough, in Scandinavian countries, weirdly, because they put a lot of vitamin D supplements in their foods, um, had, uh, I've got high levels of uh, vitamin D. The implications to COVID were a lot lower than in countries where vitamin D levels are low, which are Italy, Spain, and the United Kingdom, um, which is so. Just get yourself outside. However, I've shown some food stuffs there that can really help raise vitamin D levels as well. The two biggest ones that you can uh, eat that are full of vitamin D are eggs, well, egg yolk actually, and mushrooms. So here's a little thing today. If you want to up your vitamin D level, um, a mushroom omelet and take it outside and eat it outside. Man, it's cha-ching, a double bubble there. I've also shown you some critical uh, B vitamins there and the main sources of foods that are good for vitamins and also the antioxidant vitamin E, which is not only good for brain health, but also for uh, cardiovascular health. Now, I'm going to say something about vitamins is taking, should you take vitamin supplements? Do you know what? There's not a lot of evidence that actually taking that they're metabolized effectively in the human body. They are better from the foods that, that are contained in them. So it's actually eating the foods with them in is far better for us. I'll give you two caveats around that. One is vitamin D as a supplement is fine to take uh, from November to March when the light drops a lot. So often I'd say, okay to take vitamin D at that point, but after March, you don't need to, just get yourself outside and, and eat foods with vitamin D. And the other thing though, if you don't eat meat, if you're a vegetarian, vitamin B12 is an issue for you. Um, so try and look at things. So I'd often say if you don't eat meat, it's probably okay to take a small dose of B12 supplement. Other than that, just try and eat foods that are there. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, um, um, Despite a few technical hitches and all of this uh, for me, and particularly my voice going and stuff like that. Um, look, um, how do you do it in your world? I don't live in your world. Um, but what I want to just say a bit, just some general stuff here about health and well-being. It's just be aware of how you are feeling. You know your own body. You know how you feel, and you're feeling top of the world, brilliant. You're obviously doing good. So if you're feeling a bit sluggish, then think about this know your numbers what do i mean uh, your cholesterol level your blood pressure your blood sugar levels uh, your body mass index your uh, your basal metabolic rate just know these numbers that will give you some a clue about well maybe i might need to do something now maybe challenge yourself but um i'll just say 
be your own experiment try things out try some little things that you might have picked up from today and try it out and see does it make you feel better if it does brilliant but i'll just say do one thing at a time don't try and do it all at once just one little thing at a time and do some planning a little bit of preparation will hopefully help you because really why should you do all of this why and i'm and i'm just going to say one thing l'oreal because you're worth it thanks very much my goodness me any thank you, questions <laughs> thank you thank you john thank That's you john pleasure. um yeah can i just want to come in with there with a, with a with a couple of things john that i picked up while you were talking uh one when i was um back in the day when i was uh, a, a driving instructor and then uh, latterly a fleet driving instructor i spent an awful lot of time in a car and uh, as most of the people watching today will know you're not even sitting up straight because you're sitting there looking sitting slightly sideways <clears throat> watching your students feet most of the time um so it's a uh, so it's a difficult dynamic and like most people i had a lower back problem um and it was uh, I, I then started seeing a chiropractor and there was two things that helped me one was the exercises and actually watching that video today that you put on with the, the american lady um they were pretty much identical to the exercises that I paid my chiropractor an awful lot of money to, to be taught how to do, um, albeit some of them were standing up, but some simple basic stretches were very good. Um, and the second thing was uh, losing three stone in weight when my best mate dropped dead on the golf course, aged uh, 69, um, when there was nothing wrong with him. And I suddenly realized I was overweight. I was 15 stone for the first time in my life. And I went on a diet and lost three stone. And thankfully managed to keep two and a half of it off um, and some simple things again that you went through there from a practical perspective just planning better eating earlier in the evening waking up hungry having breakfast drinking more water very very simple things you know there was a lot of information you gave us there john and, and a lot of the technical stuff is actually packaged up in a in a booklet that john's put together to support this series called boosting up that we will share with everyone after the last session um uh, the full session next week um including some recipes that he's put together because he's a bit of a budding author and chef as well as our john um <laughs> And then one simple thing, I remember someone asking me at a conference uh, that I did a few months ago, someone uh, someone asked me whether it was better to have fruit or fruit juice. Um, and the simple analogy there is, is fruit is better for you. Um, if you think of fruit juice as being an antibiotic ingested straight into your, or injected straight into your system, and a tablet which your body has to work at, at getting the benefits from it down, that's basically the analogy. So if your body has to work harder, to digest and get the nutrients out of a fresh piece of fruit, whereas the fruit juice, and obviously quite often they're enhanced with um, additional sugars, um, just goes straight in and gives you that instant hit. So fruit, yeah, was the, was the recommendation from the nutritionist was uh, fruit was uh, better than fruit juice. So Ian, any questions? Yes, we do. Oh. First of all, John, have you recovered? Is your throat okay? My throat is fine. I just, yeah. Anyway, there you go. Sorry about that, everyone. Just... There's, there's always a bit of drama when John's involved. Yeah, there is, there is, there is. Go on, blow my neck. <laughs> I'd like to apologise to everybody watching on an Android device because it seems that they've not been able to see your face today, unfortunately. So they haven't, they've heard... they have, they haven't missed anything at all, Ian. A <laughs> um, couple of questions related to that, though. One is, could you... Um, explain how many calories are in that small pot of nuts and seeds that you take as a snack pot yeah there is about 200 in that small pot just about 200 that's way within that and if you're thinking about it as well taking andy's point here because i'm going to have to choose because you see a seed here yeah, there's a little pumpkin seed um my Don't body's going uh, and now we're not going to do it again. Uh, <laughs> you know what? I just went, I'm just going to have a little sunflower seed. And that's the thing that got stuck in the back of my throat. So be careful with these, by the way. Because um, <laughs> um, I'm going to have to chew it and it's going to go into my digestive, digestive system. My body will work like hell to break it down. And actually, I don't metabolize it all. Um, so some of it will come out. It's got fibers that my body will get rid of. Uh, so it's got um, what is called uh, insoluble fiber, so it helps roughage. Um, it's got soluble fiber. But yeah, so even though there's 200 calories there, I'm going to say something about calorie counting as well, actually. This is a good point. It's not accurate. 
It never has been. It is. It was developed by a guy called Atwell in in eighteen hundred and nine, and we haven't changed it. Um, so when you see calorie counting, it actually slightly overstates. But there's a caution here. Um, because the way we process food these days, it's much finer. Taking Andy's fruit juice things, your body will absorb more. So the more raw food, the more stuff that you can eat, um, that helps your body break down, the less calories you'll take in. So I'd often say, if you're calorie counting, cut yourself a bit of slack, um, really, because you tend to over-egg it a bit. But the, just try and keep within it and the balance. It's the balance between all of those things. So your fats, your sugars, your carbohydrates and stuff like that. Two, two good other points for calories. One, get yourself a pair of reading specs um, because they're always in very, very small writing on the <laughs> yeah, bottom of every yeah. packet of everything you ever buy, um, uh, which is one point. The second thing is we talked about Fitbit last time uh, on the Fitbit app. There's also a calorie counting thing. Um, and also another one that I use is my fitness pal. And actually, if you put into my fitness pal, Sainsbury's prawn mayonnaise sandwich, it will tell you how many calories are in there and it adds it up for you during the day. And it is and then takes your steps off and adds in your exercise. So as John was saying earlier, you know, if, if, if you can have 1900 calories a day, it takes into account the amount of exercises you're doing. If you're carrying your phone for my fitness pal <clears throat> or you're wearing a Fitbit watch, it will take that in. So all of the information is there for you. You just need to have a look for it. Um, I just just read the small pit at the bottom of the, you know, next time we're allowed in Starbucks to have, have a look at the calories. They now print it out on everything. Um, uh, and it's quite scary how much is in a, uh, uh, just a regular Starbucks muffin it's basically can be up to 25% of your daily allowance that's before you've had the coffee so yeah it's quite scary stuff but just just read inwardly digest and um, then make your choice yeah yep uh John can you do me a favor could you just uh, close sharing your screen for me I'm going to see if it will help those on Android to actually see the presenter view instead so just take off all, all screen sharing underneath where you've got your uh, microphone and yeah just to go back yeah i don't think it's going to help people on android if you're watching on an android device if you've now got uh video cameras again please let me know um the test device i've got here isn't showing any better so apologies i'm trying to see if we can fix it somehow but we're not getting anywhere with that today for uh, android users um linked into diet uh there is a couple of points on uh, number of times a day to eat or intermittent fasting do you have any thoughts on that john at all <coughs> Yeah, there's something that's been, here we go. Um, there's uh, time-restricted eating, um, which is a new, uh, again, Dr. Michael Mosey talks about this. Um, so you restrict the times that you eat. So, you know, say eight o'clock in the morning till six o'clock at night is when you do your eating. Um, so then after that, it gives you your body chances to uh, um, sort of, metabolize the food and then obviously we can start d dr driving down into sleep he, he, he views that around sleep fasting's an interesting thing it, it can work it can work and um, you, you don't have days where you don't eat at all it's just eat very very low calorie content It'd be around about 400 calories is usually the way for fasting i'm going to a word of caution with with fasting is this um uh, your brain goes into meltdown, um, so you lose a lot of concentration and focus, and you be quite grumpy. Um, so um, just <laughs> I can I can do that from Andy because he's shaking. So you can remember him doing that big dive. He's really grumpy. Um, so they can work. They can work. It shocks the body a little bit, but you know you sort of do the four and two. Just dropping. Like just I'd always say if you on a day when you are fasting, try not to be doing anything that's really sort of taxing or avoid people. <laughs> um, but re <laughs> um, so not good. So obviously not good for driving instructors then. <laughs> not good for the driving instructors. You've got to absolutely not be concentrating. You're gonna have a go with them. Um, yeah. However, what I'd say is definitely the number one thing: breakfast. Breakfast. Have breakfast and actually we probably eat the other way around really we should get up in the morning and have something big to eat for breakfast and then so you know breakfast like a king and dinner 
you know, tea time like a pauper, but we, we tend to flick it around the other way around. Um, so the other thing is, there's not wrong about grazing little bits. So I'd have a decent breakfast, some stuff, your seeds and nuts and other fruit and that. And then throughout the day, bits and bits and bits that are foods that are low in glycemic index. So watching, not doing sugary foods, just doing foods that gently release their energy over two hours and keeping your energy levels at a certain level and then boost it up with those things is a good way of doing it anyway. The, the other two tips there really um, from someone that went through the pain um, is uh, you get a smaller smaller plate but fill it up so don't fill up a big plate fill up a small yeah. plate and the other bit of advice and I don't know whether this is true or not but I think it was John that told me so it must be um, <laughs> it, it takes 20 minutes for your stomach to tell your brain it's full it does. so that's how we manage to overeat so you just eat eat and eat and eat and then 20 minutes later you think oh i've eaten too much that's because it's taken 20 minutes for the message to get back so again bear that in mind a uh, couple of other questions uh, one was about vitamin d um, and yeah. you mentioned about going out into the sunlight to get vitamin d etc um, yeah. interesting this point i've never considered this before uh, julia mentions that a friend of hers has mentioned to her that um, it affects different colored skinned people in different ways so the darker your skin the more you need to be in the sunlight to get the benefit of the vitamin d i've never considered that before is that something you've you know of yeah it's got it's absolutely quite true it is absolutely true and um so hence because of the uh the the, the, the the melanin in the skin um, is is about a sun blocker and a ultraviolet light blocker because obviously there's a lot more skin because you know it's our body is trying to protect us against uh, skin cancer um, so which is you know there's an issue about that so you will need to be out a little bit longer if you you're darker skinned coloured so um, and then but generally then the the the, the, the uh, someone who's like us Caucasian you know and and you've got to be careful. Um, obviously in bright sunlight if you've got very pale skin you know um, obviously uh, you can put blocker on uh, but don't put it too high but you can look the, the simple thing is as long as your face and your hands are uncovered your body will still take absorbing ultraviolet light to produce so you don't have to be naked which is a good thing for, <laughs> for me anyway um, and actually don't forget it doesn't need to be sunshine Certainly yeah, now, it's just daylight. It's just daylight and through clouds, particularly in summer, our problem in this country in the Northern Hemisphere come when the clocks go back at the end of October. It is, um, we are vitamin D deficient. So he's just trying to get some supplement then is fine to do. It, it, it's obviously a very good thing that we don't have to be naked because an awful lot of naked driving instructors running around is a sight I don't even want to contemplate. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure it wouldn't go down very well with our customers. Uh, there was another a question. marketing we, idea for Andy Mitchell there. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then uh, Derek asks, as someone who has type 1 diabetes, food which most people would consider healthy is in fact not. For example, granola, muesli, for instance, uh, due to the high carb count. Uh, yeah. What would you recommend on the basis when calorie counting? Um, yeah, for somebody who's with diabetes. And diabetes is type 1. Um, so with this, obviously you have to in, in, inject in, in, insulin uh, with type 1. Um, obviously, you just got to be careful and mindful of, but some complicated carbohydrates is, and I would say like grains and oats that don't, the trouble with granola is they're actually sugar coated and they've got all of these dry fruits in them, which are very, like, you know, if you see a, a sultana or anything, they're very, very high sugar. Um, so you think, oh, I'm being really good if I eat dried fruits. I'd actually avoid dried fruits and stuff like that. Um, so just having really then, I'd go down the vegetable route. Um, beans, legumes, legumes are obviously runner beans, anything that grows and hangs down. They are good, they've got really good sugars in them um, that are, again, at complicated carbohydrates, which then shouldn't affect someone with diabetes type one. It should just help raise the sugar levels to a level that's manageable for the, for, for, uh, the body. And, and avoid those sorts of things. Porridge less, oats. More, but more, more more natural, less processed. 
Yeah, you definitely. Anything, de- that's, anything that's been put into a box or, you know, it's got more process, or more, more difficult. I will say something as well is when you cook food, um, you're, uh, you're releasing sugars. And you'll you notice when you do your carrots and parsnips and you roast them, they're much much sweeter. So um, the cooking process drags out a lot more sugars uh, and converts some stuff into more sugars. So actually, raw foods um, one are uh, are better in some ways. Got to be careful with meat and fish, but um, the, <laughs> obviously, but um, raw foods you don't take as many calories in at all. You don't absorb as much sugars in them. So obviously when you're eating salads, so I, you know, when I'm having a salad, I'll get a, a red cabbage and a white cabbage and I'll chop them up fine and plonk them in. I'll put raw vegetables into salads, a lot more crunchier. And I'm, I'm reducing the sugar intake, but I'm actually also helping the body. It's just another thing, you know, too much cooked food, maybe is not always good for us. And back to the beans as well, John. Beans in a back. salad are great. You know, just yeah. be adventurous. The salad doesn't, yeah. you know, it can be whatever you want to put. Just mix it up, put it in, and yeah. Uh, good. I think a couple of things going back to the vitamin D again, and something that I can't remember if was mentioned in the presentation mm-hmm. or not. Um, th- this idea that we do need to sort of be outdoors. So sitting in a car coming in through the glass, we're not going to get it. So yeah. as instructors, perhaps we should consider more thinking about trying to do briefings outside of the car, trying to spend yeah. some time outside of the car if we can. Maybe if we're doing fault analysis and we, we've got to a stop and it's convenient <clears throat> enough to step out for a few minutes. Uh, is there anything else instructors could do? Yeah, there's there, there's lots here, and I mean, I was uh, I followed a, a, a I saw a bus at a bus stop the other day, and he was obviously early. Um, and whereas normally the bus driver just opens the door and sits there, this bus driver was doing his exercises. He'd got out of the bus, he stood by the side, and he was touching his toes. And then I looked in the mirror, and he's reaching up towards the sky, and he was doing stuff, you know. And it was it was uh, I was a bit I was a bit shocked actually, but that there's nothing, you know, if we get somewhere two minutes early. I mean, we have we have a big thing here when we're doing um, event days of like instructors getting out of the car, walking around, um, and, and and greeting the client. You know, shaking hands with the client. How are you? Obviously, we're not allowed to shake hands with them anymore. We have to greet them from two meters away, etc. But get out of the car, walk around. You know, even if you only walk around the car once or twice, or or or, or teaching people how to do you know the show and tell stuff. Walk walk around the car. As John said, if, we, if the, the hour and a half standing up very very quickly a day it gets picked up with that the series of five minutes here five minutes before five minutes after the lesson and just take the some little graze pots like john showed there or even you know buy the graze packs from supermarkets um there's the one of the range the range that i get is a uh, less than 150 calories a pot uh, and it doesn't look much but actually it does fill you up because you do just sort of nibble on them um so yeah stuff like that is really important just to get out and it's too easy sometimes just to pull up you know and, and not get out but particularly in the summer months just get out and, and chat to people outside the vehicle do briefings yeah, and then, I, and I would just, I would just say as well, Ian, to to reiterate, in the winter, then, then maybe consider taking a vitamin D supplement. Then, uh, as soon as the clocks go back, and if you're going to do it, to make sure you get the one which is one daily dose and take it last thing at night before you go to sleep, because it's more effectively metabolised while we're sleeping. Um, and then, as I say, maybe start looking at the foods that contain high levels of vitamin D. Mm. It would help. What's the best thing for vitamin D just as a one type snack sort of food that maybe they could carry in the car, perhaps? Well, I, <coughs> depends on the on the, the, the preferences. As I said, the two biggest two are mushrooms and, and eggs. So, you know, just boil an egg and have it wrapped up. And it's the egg yolk is, is the thing that's got the um, uh, thing. So they're, they're portable. Put them in a salad. You get in it. If you can if you can stomach it. Yeah, I don't. I I usually put these in raw mushrooms sliced up thinly in a salad. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine to yeah. eat. And and again, you're getting that vitamin D levels in. Some of the seeds and nuts have vitamin D, and I'm just say the best two of them. But as I say, we're going to give you a lot more information about this. And um, I think I've I don't know I've about seven or eight recipes which are vitamin D rich recipes I put together in the in the booklet that's going to be available next week for you.
Brilliant, thank you. Uh, just going back to hydration as well, I'm thinking about water. Is it, uh, do you get the same benefit if, I mean, like myself, I'm not very keen on drinking just plain water, so I'll often put like a cordial into it. Do you, are you still, you're still getting hydration, you're still getting the water to the brain, aren't you? Yes, you are. Um, just be careful with cordials and the sugar content, that's all I'd say. Other than that, that's fine to do. And I do say to people, you are getting the water. I want to say something as well. Uh, if you have a beer, your body will take the water from the beer <laughs> and the wine. <laughs> but just be mindful of how much of that you're drinking <laughs> is yeah. all I'd say. <laughs> but you can. There's other ways of getting water into it. And by the way, there is water in food that you eat. Um, so, you know, you think about uh, cucumber and, you know, cucumber is 98% water. Yeah. Raw yeah. courgette. Raw courgette. All of these do have water. So, but what we tend to say is a litre and a half to two, depends on your size, actually, you really are getting yourself hydrated. Uh, yeah. that and, and, sorry, and tap, uh, tap spring water, does it matter? Is there any benefits, would you say, to having sort of, uh, you know, spring waters as opposed to just normal tap water? Uh, some of the uh, some of the um, spring waters, you know, the mineral waters have do have other minerals in them, which are good. Tap water tends not. And there's a bit of a controversy with the obviously the fluorides in them, which aren't particularly good for you, but they are very good for your teeth and bones. So it's an, what I do if you're going to have tap water is, you know, um, filter it. Just get a very cheap Brita filter, leave it in the fridge. All like, or one of the like Andy's got there. Um, you see this, uh, the Institute of Water. It's one of my clients. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, subtle plug there, you know, subtle plug. Um, little plug for them. Um, but yeah, um, so filter it, leave it in the fridge. But actually, what you can do with just tap water is, if you haven't got a filter, fill a jug up, pour it in the fridge two hours all the fluorides dissipate they all go right. and it's a bit more purer cool uh we are running up against time everyone but yeah. just uh, there are some good questions coming through so i wanted to try and get to as many of those as possible <laughs> um obviously a couple of instructors have mentioned the inevitable if they're drinking a lot during the day they're out in the car there's not an awful lot of public conveniences around anymore one or two have suggested that perhaps you know if they're they're minimizing the input during the day is it okay to kind of tank up and get extra water in the evenings when they're back home again <clears throat> what i'd say is this probably the most important time to take in water as soon as you get up right as soon as you get up i'd have a pint of water and the reason being you are massively dehydrated when you wake up we all are every single human because don't forget your body's still working and it's been lying there for 10 well eight nine hours hopefully uh sleep working away because you'll know when you first tinkle in the morning um the smell of sugar puffs and bright orange stuff comes out <laughs> sorry about that but we are we're all human um you're massively dehydrated so that's probably the most important i'd have a pint of water myself then get your metabolism going and then minimize it through the day yeah and then back on it not too much late at night because we don't want you waking up wanting to go to the toilet i'd rather you sleep um and don't forget you're still taking it in in other bits of your tea you know, the cups of tea is little bits. Um, just don't overdo it with caffeine. Um, and the food that you're eating, you will be getting enough. But that's the most important time. And it might help them then thinking, oh, my God, I've got to go. Um, you know. Definitely, definitely. Uh, well, thanks for everything that you've uh, done for us and you've brought a really interesting presentation again to us. And this has really been a great feature of these uh, going through. They've been really... Um, significant i think for all driving instructors all of the episodes so far and i think everybody's really looking forward to next week's as well andy so uh thanks everyone uh thanks john for putting a lot of work and effort into this we do appreciate it that's a pleasure ian thanks for all your support both of you for and uh, reminding me about things and sorry guys thanks very much for coming uh lovely to uh, spend a little bit of time with you i'm just sorry about my uh, losing my voice a little bit and just anyway there you go <laughs> entertaining and, uh, don't, don't forget to download the handout because it's a live Excel document, so you can fill it in. So download that before you leave the, the webinar today. I uh, look forward to seeing you next week where we're going to talk about emotions, um, how about changing your emotions, and I'm going to wrap up the previous three sessions in a bit of a summary, um, give you access to the Boosting Up booklet, 
um, and then take some more questions. So I look forward to seeing you same time, same place next week. And thanks, John, for joining us from sunny Northumberland. It is, it is sunny now. Yeah, it is actually brilliant, mate. Go. Great to see you. Uh, look after yourselves. Thanks, thanks John. John. Really Cheers, great to man. have you guys. Thank you. And with regards to the download, just quickly, you'll need to download it, open a local copy, and then you should be able to edit. It may initially say it's read only, but once you've saved a local copy, you'll be fine. Any problems, just let me know as always. Okay, thanks everyone. Hopefully I'll get the Android problem fixed for next week. Um, we'll be back on ball again, and I look forward to seeing everybody, as Andy said, same time next week. Thanks again, John. Thanks, Andy. Cheers, Al. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks, guys.